All right, guys, we are now live for another Tuesday, Nomberg Law Live. And as we do, we come to you on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Pacific. And it's my, my tagline, or what I like to say, is it's interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise. And I've got a buddy of mine, Christopher Nicolason from Colorado Springs with me. And I'm so glad to see his face and his no shave November. Good to see you, bud. Absolutely. Good to see you too, Bernard. Absolutely. And guys, I, I've known uh, Chris and his beautiful bride, Gretchen, for a couple of years now. Been fortunate enough to, to see them in person a couple of times at a at seminars that we go to, but we see each other all the time virtually. And I just, I love them. And we were out in, in Colorado a couple of summers ago and dadgummit, they drove across the state just to have lunch with us. Such, oh, just such awesome friends. I'm so glad to see you today and catch up with you. Absolutely, Bernard. The feeling is mutual, completely mutual. And the nice thing for us with our kids being a bit older, it's easy for us, for Gretchen and I to kind of pack up and drive across state to just go have lunch. It's awesome. Yeah, plus we both have Sydney's yes. in our world yes. and a lot of commonalities. But Chris, let's, before we jump into today's topic, we're going to talk a little bit about Colorado laws and dealing with personal injuries and things. Share a little bit about your practice, a little bit about you and the family and things like that, and then we'll get, we'll get going. Absolutely. So I am an attorney who came to law a little bit later in life. So I went to law school when I was 35. I um, graduated law school at 38, um, did my first year of law school actually away from my family. Um, they stayed here in Colorado Springs and I moved to Toledo, Ohio for a year and did my first year at University of Toledo. Had a great experience there and still have many friends from Toledo and then transferred to University of Denver and graduated from there. I've been married for almost 24 years. Um, it'll be 24 years on December 3rd of this year. And then I have two daughters um, who are just absolutely amazing. And Sydney is our oldest and Megan is our youngest. Um, Sydney has just recently got married. And then Megan um, is in her first year of law school out in Louisville, Kentucky, um, which is its own conversation as well. And then, um, so Springs Law Group was founded back in February of 2017. Um, myself and my partner, Jake Kimball, um, we, and then we had another partner when we first started. Um, and then we started out as a personal injury, family law, and a little bit of a state planning firm. Um, I had primarily done family law for the majority of my law career up to that point. And then Jake had done, he actually said he used to work for the dark side, which was the insurance defense side, and then switched over to the light, um, which is plaintiff side. And then since then, we've transitioned primarily to just a personal injury side. Mm-hmm. And then where Jake, and then we just hired an associate, Jeremy, oh, who does good. litigation. Mm-hmm. And then Jake does primarily pre-lit and supervises the cases at this point. And then I handle the day-to-day business operations and the ins and outs of kind of social and anything in regards to all that. Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks for catching us up and sharing a little bit about that, Chris. What, what I want to talk about today, every, every state has its own unique sets of laws. And you guys being in Colorado, with so many people having to deal with the weather who are not used to dealing with the weather, most notably the snow and the ice, and, and what comes in the winter months or during the snow season. And you have so many wonderful venues throughout the state, so many awesome places to for exercise, recreation, family getaways, all during the, the year, of course. But Colorado has its own unique sets of laws when it comes to dealing with people who get hurt and you're dealing with environments and, and weather that they're not used to. And it's, it's, it's so different for the people who live there, the, the natives, I'll call them, who are used to it. And you can, I'm sure you guys can immediately spot, you're not from around here. You're not used to, you're not used to the snow or whatever it may be. So from your perspective, what, I guess, Chris, do, do you guys see lots of claims like this throughout the year? How, how prevalent is it in your practice? Yeah, so it's actually really relevant because one of the things that we deal with is the weather actually being an issue that can either, or a factor 
in an accident case. And part of that is because you can wake up here one morning and it's 70 degrees and sunny out. And then by the mid afternoon, we're getting golf ball size hail coming down and just damaging vehicles. I mean, this past, this past summer, my partner, Jake, his vehicle, he had a, uh, a Honda um, SUV and it was completely totaled um, from the hail. I mean, cracks on the windshield, it was really heavy. And so it was super nice and sunny in the morning and then switched to that. Um, yesterday, like I was telling you before we came on air is it was 70 out and then switched to 40 this morning. We had a little bit of dusting of snow last night. And then even this morning, as I'm driving on the road, you could see like kind of remnants of ice, you know, slick kind of setting. And so it is that idea, even though I'm in a four wheel drive car, I still have to be careful and aware of everything going on. So you can't in Colorado, it's the idea that you can't use the weather as an excuse because you still have to be aware and cognizant of everything that's going on. And so we've even had it where the winds are so high out here at times that I've seen, literally, I've seen semi trucks blow over and tip over and fall on the side um, because of the weather. So you have to be aware on when do I kind of either stay back or stay home? How much distance do I need to give myself if I'm driving in a vehicle? And also we have a lot of people, like you said, because we have all these different areas that are very active. So what kind of safety gear do I need to bring with me? Do I need to, you know, if I'm out on my bicycle on a nice day, do I need to wear my helmet? Do I need to do these things? And it's interesting because in the state of Colorado, they actually don't have a mandatory helmet law, even though our bicycle population is very, very large. Yeah. Like yeah. we have literally right outside of our office here, we have a really long bike trail out here and we have a pretty busy bike shop across the street from us here and it's one thing to where i've always you know found it interesting that there isn't a mandatory there isn't a mandatory law on that but from our legal standpoint it could always be argued that if somebody's injured by not taking those proper safety precautions even though it's not the law mm -hmm. the question is what a reasonable person actually you know kind of needs you know could that accident or those injuries have prevent, been prevented if they had worn out things like that and, and Chris, with the added, um, with the added factor of weather being a component to a lot of these cases, let's just take a, a, a typical fender bender where somebody doesn't stop in time at a red light mm -hmm. and they slide into the car ahead of them and it causes damages to the vehicle. It causes potentially some we'll call them some soft tissue injuries to the driver who was the, the lead car. And I guess that my, my question to you is, while the weather is not an excuse uh, for any activities, uh, I mean, any actions, whether they're um, intentional or not, of course, you're not gonna intentionally do that, but how do you deal with, let's say you represent that lead driver who's sitting in the car just waiting for the light to turn and you've got somebody from behind that just skids all the way into them what what's your approach with the insurance company how do you represent your your client who's now got we'll call them some whiplash neck injuries talk about the weather's impact in that as well yeah, so what we the way we handle that is right at the beginning from the initial consultation or conversation, we want to talk, we want to get all the facts that the card got on the table. Mm -hmm. For us, it's asking them, you know, describe the accident, but then also talk to us about any what were the conditions that day, not only the weather, but what were the conditions of the road? Um, what were the conditions of the other vehicle, you know, their brakes, what have you, you know, were they paying attention? Did we have distracted driving? Was any issues, things like that. Then, so we have that as our precursors, our starting point. And now then, if the accident is big enough or needs to happen, we can get an expert to actually come out and do an examination of an accident recon reconstruction expert to come out and look at things and say, because the weather was this way, they should have braked here, they failed to do that, things like that. Alternatively, if we don't you know, get an expert on board, what we do is we explain that in the demand when we're asking, after treatment is done, when we're asking for our settlement amount, we talk to them about that. Because it's not an excuse for the person that hit them to you know, still do it. Now, as I say that, as the person representing the injured party, 
it's not an excuse. However, one thing we do find then is that then the, the at-fault insurance company, what they're going to do though, is they're going to use every single thing they can. It's basically like taking spaghetti and throwing it at the wall, right? To see what's, right. Right. I'm gonna use that bad weather that day and say, no, 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 our person wasn't solely at fault here because the weather mm -hmm. was part of the cause here, mm -hmm. which can then diminish, potentially diminish the percentage or their offer. And well, so that's what I was getting ready to ask you in Alabama, we have a contrib defense. And if there's any contribution that nullifies what can be argued in a case, but it sounds like y'all have comparative uh, as a defense. Kind of explain that in, in layperson's terms, if you will. Yeah, so for us, it is off that percentage. And so if we find for us, like our client was, like if it's one where we have two parties kind of coming together in an intersection and both parties, drivers were actually 50-50 at fault, mm -hmm. we then say there's no case because then there's no compensation for either side. Mm -hmm. And so the way you want to think about it is like from a, a regular person standpoint, I guess, or a driver is, is a percentage standpoint. Then if the insurance company, like in this situation with the weather would say, well, you know, we actually found that our client was only 90% at fault. It means then they're going to reduce by 10% the compensation that they would then be giving to the injured party. That would be their offer. And Chris, we, if, if this went to a jury, if you took this to a trial, can a jury, the decision maker in the case also use that as part of their analysis in order to make a decision on the case. Absolutely, that'd be an argument that they could make and then definitely they could bring it down. And it's something that we talk about, not only at the very beginning of the case, but throughout the case, because there's that, I think there's an idea out there, Bernard, of going to court and having a jury of your peers decide things is exciting because of the way it's portrayed on TV and things like that, yeah. right? We want that like, you know, gene yeah. hacking moment where we're just slamming our fists That's up. right. That's right. But, but the reality. <laughs> yeah, but in reality, and I've had people walk out who have watched cases with me where they go, that was really boring. <laughs> and not only is it boring, but at the same time, it, there's a lot of risk. And so we talk about that quite a bit of a risk reward right. on litigation because of the idea then that I'm a big believer that prior to a jury deciding you have a lot of control as the client or the injured party and in, in yeah. where you can choose to settle. Yeah. But then once you choose to go in, each side presents their case and what the other side's going to do, the insurance company then at that point is going to do is use all of those things. That's right. Jury's head and go, maybe they were only 70% at fault and we're gonna reduce their compensation now by 30%. Yeah. So yeah. that's risk right there, I think. Yeah, that's... Guys, that doesn't matter if you're in Alabama, Colorado, wherever you are, that's some of the analysis you have to go through when you're attempting, say, a mediation before you get to a trial, that you have a lot more control and a lot of things don't factor as much, say, in a mediation as they might in a trial, because in a trial, everything comes to light. So anyway, that's, that's another conversation for another day. And I'm talking with Christopher Nicolason out of Colorado Springs, Springs Law Group, we're talking about some of the uniqueness of Colorado laws dealing with the weather, which we all know can vary by 30, 40, 50 degrees in a day or two. And Chris, one example, I've been fortunate enough to come out west, uh, Utah, Colorado to ski in, in the years past. And we usually ski in the spring, kids spring break. Yep. So, and that's usually the end of the ski season. And before I get into that, I want to say hey to a couple of buddies of ours. I got Morris Lilienthal, Mo up in Huntsville. I got Nathan Harris here in Birmingham. Got my dad down in Gulf Shores. So thank you guys for spending a few minutes with us. But Chris, I can start out skiing on a spring break day, say in late March, early April, close to the end of the season. And the beginning of the day, the, there's great snow, and, and but the sun is out. You're skiing basically with just one layer on because by the end of the day, say 12, one o'clock, the right. temperature has risen by 20, 30 degrees and you have slush at the bottom of a run. Right. And I know we're not gonna get too much into the, the skiing liability, those things, because I know you guys don't really handle those kind of things. Right. But I do know that Colorado has extremely unique laws for that. 
But my question to you is, Chris, do they have, is there a special court or place for adjudication for those types of cases? Or does that come through the regular court system, same place you'd have, say, a car wreck? Generally, you're going to find that those things, in, in my experience, would come through the regular court system. So the county, so the venue would be the county that the accident actually happened. Um, and a lot of times, I mean, what we try to do at times is, you, you know, you're going to find where the accident, you know, whatever county the accident or incident happened, a lot of times where Breckenridge is or Aspen or Vail, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it would be up in those counties. Um, where you would then make your claim. So those courts then are going to be, those district courts are going to be a lot more familiar with those actual injury accidents or claims mm -hmm. against the ski slope, things like that. Um, the judge's dockets, I was just doing a WebEx hearing the other day for one of my last family cases. Mm -hmm. And the judge there was even telling me how she's like, we, she's like, I am literally at least double booked in every case for the, you know, from morning to afternoon from now until the end of the year, I do not have a single day off until wow. the end of the year, except for the holidays, whatever the court right. related right. holidays are, but every single case is at least double booked. And so even in these smaller counties, because of the pandemic, because of the number of cases being litigated these days, parties need to be aware too, that if we're setting for court in any of these cases, you're not getting a, a speedy trial date where you're going to be seen in a month or two. We just set uh, an injury case for litigation and we set out in the August of next year for trial. Wow. Case. So, Almost a year, 10, yeah. 10 months. Yeah. yeah. Chris, along those same lines, let's go back to, to the motor vehicle um, uh, queries that we're talking about. With the weather, with all of the mountains in Colorado, periodically you may see signs that say, you know, watch for falling rocks yep. or um, the bridges may ice over or s snow, et cetera. Here, here's my question to you. Let's say that we've got signage out that the Colorado Department of Transportation, whoever's in charge of the roads, says uh, proceed with caution or the signs may say this road is not passable. Here's some barriers, those kind of things. Right. And we go around that and then we have an accident or we cause an accident. Mm -hmm. What kind of factor, how does that play into that comparative analysis that we're looking at? Um, and can the state be responsible for any of this? Yeah, I think it factors in quite a bit actually. Um, I think it factors in, in the sense that you now were told not to do something. Um, they, gave you, they gave you proper precaution, right? So the state, the county, um, gave you proper precaution in that sign by saying, do not basically stop, do not go forward. And you now made a choice, a voluntary choice mm -hmm. to do that. And by doing that, you're actually putting yourself and any other drivers then at risk that also chose it. Now, if there are other drivers there too, and there's an accident cause, my question would be at that point is, did you both actually just actually break the, you know, the law or the rule, right? which then right. really kills any potential. Um, you know, because now you, and it's that idea of assumption of the risk, right? Are you now assuming a risk because of the fact that you chose to go around a sign that said, do not go here. We gave you other avenues or detours to go. Mm -hmm. I think the idea now, it's the idea, and this is why there's lawyers out there. Is it possible to sue the state? Sure, absolutely. Because we can sue anybody. But the thing I always ask is, even though you can sue that person, will you actually get anything for it? Right. Will there be any right. true compensation? And I would say because of the signage as that first piece, mm -hmm. that percentage, even if anything you have, I think it's shooting well below 50% at that point, even just based on a, a short fact pattern like that, because I think it is very difficult to get around that because of you could ask yourself is, if you had chosen then not to go around that sign, would the accident or injuries have ever even happened? And more likely than not, they wouldn't have. It, we're, we're kind of running through a bunch of different law school queries, but these are so real uh, type of stories. Uh, let me give you another one, because these are th these are unique to Colorado because of the weather contribution that we're talking about. And frankly, this could be similar conversations in Utah and other states that have to deal with different types of, of weather. Okay. But Chris, let's say we got a bunch of college kids who are coming out skiing uh, in December, and we've got five buddies. Uh, hopefully, they're from the same bubble in their campus. COVID issues aside, let's assume that it's okay for them to be out there. And they're all sharing one vehicle. One guy's dad has rented the vehicle. 
and one of the boys is a permissible driver. Let's say he's 25 for this yep. purpose. And unfortunately, he gets in an accident. And some of the boys in the vehicle are also injured. Mm -hmm. We have in Alabama a guest passenger statute that if you're strictly a guest in that vehicle, you may not have a claim against your own driver because they were doing you a favor. Gotcha. But here's my extra fact pattern mm -hmm. for you. Let's say the boys were splitting gas money. Mm -hmm. They already had paid the driver. Here's my 20 bucks for our trip. So you're no longer a guest. Interesting. It takes you into a different legal standard or a different legal situation. So my question to you, I guess, in overall, does Colorado have a guest passenger defense or statute that addresses these types of uh, sharing conditions? Interesting. Yeah. So we haven't run into that, but what we have run into is the actually the passenger scenario mm -hmm. where we represented a passenger and she was driving with a friend. Um, so similar to this situation, um, the friend was the one driving and pulled out and got T-bone when she shouldn't have pulled out. Um, and then ultimately, so who did the passenger, you know, go, who did the passenger ultimately, you know, enter into negotiations right. with and go after the right. claim was the driver. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think, and so I haven't seen a guest passenger statute, but it is that thing where then as a person that was injured in an accident, they have the ability then here in Colorado to go after the at fault driver, which in this case was the driver. Mm -hmm. And then with that as well, I think there's another component though that has to be talked about here is when we talk to our clients, one of the things they tell us all the time though is, is I don't want to sue my friend. Right. Right. Because right. now you have these five buddies and they're all going, but I don't want to sue my buddy. I don't want to take him off and do these things. Right. And we, so the way we actually do things out here at our firm is we actually just start out with a, with a pre-litigation contract only. Mm -hmm. We do not move into a litigation contract until we're at a spot where negotiations just cannot move forward at all. We're just hitting the wall. Mm -hmm. And then when we talk to them about that, we're not suing anybody in this first phase. We're just talking. We're just trying to come to a settlement with their insurance and that's what they have insurance for. So right. a lot of it is an explanation or a process in that sense too. I think that can actually be very informative because for us, we don't want friends suing friends if we don't, you know what I mean? If we're not at that spot, we don't want to create a rift between people. And so I think it's important that we kind of dis distinguish that piece of it as well. You, you know, and that's so, you just brought up something that's so important and that's the, the communication between client and, and uh, their lawyer. Right. And it's really upon the law firm. And this is what I like to tell my, my future clients or current clients. My job is to take a little bit of stress off of you by providing answers. Yep. What are your questions? You may not even know your questions yet, but here's what I know about the law. And the more that you can explain, like you just said, pre-litigation, it allows the, the client, and I know we're getting a little bit off topic, but it's the same, it's, it all fits together. Yeah. The more the more information they have about how the world works by way of Colorado law and insurance, I think it gives them more comfort knowing, well, here are my decisions. Right. I mean, here, here are my, my, ultimately what I have to choose from, from a decision standpoint. Absolutely. So let, let's Absolutely. stay in Colorado. Go ahead, Chris. You got well, another thought on that. And I want to mention actually, too, as you're talking about weather in a sense of not necessarily auto, but the idea of, um, so like during a snowstorm or an ice storm that we get out here quite frequently. Um, we've had some cases too, where people like, what is the, where they've actually just been injured on like a slip and fall, mm -hmm. um, walking by at a gas station or, you know, other areas like that. And it's because either like the ice is frozen up from coming down, you know, as the, as the snow was coming down through the night. And so then it's important. I think it's kind of a twofold thing for the businesses or the owners to make sure then too, that they've got procedures that they have, you know, proper care, you know, being maintained, like when we know that there's a snowstorm and they can hit fast, but when we know that one is coming, that we've got people like an all hands on deck approach going, we need to get the de-icer out there. We need to put signs up. We need to put a cleaning checklist or a checking, you know, a checklist out, things like that to make sure that there's safety protocols in place so that if something happens, mm -hmm. then people are aware that, yeah, there's a nice little, or we have it blocked off or things like right. that. Right. Then alternatively, like if you're the person actually at the gas station or what have you, 
you just really, during those moments of these storms, I think you have to be really, really aware of your surroundings. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, Bernard, for me too, is even though, and I understand these slip and falls happen and, you know, and part of it is things just happen, but there's no reason that, um, I think if we can be careful, because no amount of money is ever going to really help your broken ankle right. um, and truly heal from an injury like that, um, things like that. So that's why I think it's just another avenue that shows how quickly weather can hit on a deep freeze. Um, and a lot of times out here too, we'll get that black ice where you won't even see it. Right. And so you've got to have that like action plan in place on both sides. Like how are we thinking as a business? And then how are we thinking as an individual when we're walking around? That's it. It's, it's so true. You're, you're, you headed into the last area where I want to talk. But before we get to that, I want to say hey to our buddy Don McClure out of Houston. Good, good friends with both of us and my fantasy league partner champions two years ago, <laughs> Don. Great fella. Um, two things about life in the South, Chris, as a comparison to, to what you deal with in Colorado. One, there is a driving experience at our motor track here. And part of the driving experience is driving on black ice. Really? So you can actually pay to have that experience. And I know oh. you're thinking, why would anybody ever want to do this? <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Okay. And then secondly, you, you mentioned all of these things that potentially business owners need to do and they know weather is coming in. Yeah. In, in Alabama, if there's even a hint, if there's even going to be a, a little bit of a flurry, if there's any accumulation, our whole city shuts down. Yeah, we don't, have, we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the the salt or the sand or the machines to clear right. anything. Right. And famously, about five or six years ago, when we had our snowmageddon in the south, yes. we had a doctor who famously walked across the city from one hospital to another about a five mile trek because he ended up performing a surgery, a, I believe a life saving surgery that only he knew how to do this particular surgery. So he's a local local hero. Yeah. But uh, anyway, life in the South versus out in Colorado. But what what I want to talk, the last topic I want to head into, you touched on a little bit, is business owners' responsibilities to the public, people who own uh, rental properties and their responsibility to people who are renting their home or their condo, Mm -hmm. they've got to be proactive. And it's not like the weather... Uh, is the same way all year round. So you don't have snow all year round. You have months that are phenomenal mm-hmm. and, and people come out there in that time of the year. But I want you to just touch a little bit more, Chris, about homeowners who rent out their properties or business owners who expect the public to come in. Uh, what are their responsibilities when there is that weather? Yeah, I think we have a, so I think the business owners and the homeowners, whenever you invite people in, obviously with the homeowners or the renters, if it's through via Airbnb or VRBO, I mean, there's obviously certain contractual pieces that you would have to follow with those places. But then additionally, um, we have a, we have a duty of care to any of what we would call our invitees, right? We're inviting people into our store or to our rental property. And so it's an interesting thing that you say this because one of the things I've noticed, even as I've traveled during the pandemic at times, and I've used an Airbnb or things like that. Um, We were in Vegas probably about six weeks ago and we used an Airbnb. And honestly, Bernard, one of the things they've even adapted to is the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, And so even like you're saying is we have to adapt. And if it's adapting to weather or adapting to the pandemic, but the reality was, is there was a strict checklist for us, both not only emailed to us, but also written in their main binder um, they had like foodies, they had talked about the wipe down that they had, um, all of these other protocols going on. They had specific instruction too when you leave on where to put everything for cleanup purposes and things like that. And so even here with weather, I think it's important then too, you do have to have your place outfitted properly for weather um, so that then if you know that there's going to be a storm or things like that, that then the the users then have proper, you know, access to salt or, pro, you know, things like that to help them out. And then with the business, I think it's a little different in that sense too, because then they're the ones who are, obviously with an Airbnb, you're kind of relying on the people staying to have access to, right. you know, safety protocols, where like if I'm at a gas station or at a store, then I've got to have a staff that's ready or a maintenance staff or crew then that can actually go out and, and set everything up for success at that point in time. Um, 
I always equate it to, to like at the grocery store then, when it does get slushy out or things like that, what do we see? We see aisles and aisles just of wet boot prints, things like that. And then I see many aisles at times will have the cone set up because then you've got the floor person in there just mopping the floor along and kind of running that while, you know, they're going from spot to spot, basically playing cleanup as people are coming here to walk around. You know, so, it's, it's all the, the cost of doing business these yeah, days. Absolutely. And, and depending on what part of the country that it'll determine what you need to, to have in place to protect the public and to protect the business as yeah. it, its own. Chris, I could talk to you all day, bud. Thanks, but it's, it's the fastest 30 minutes of my week. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise about Colorado law. Thank I want to thank you even more importantly for being a good friend and, and always having something fun going on. Guys, if you don't follow the Springs Law Group or Chris on social media, you are missing out. Chris and his family and their firm, they have so much fun while they're also being such excellent lawyers in the Colorado Springs and surrounding areas. So Chris, thank you, bud, for spending some time with us today. Thank you so much, Bernard. I appreciate it quite a bit. Absolutely. And please send my regards to your lovely family. And I really hope that we get to break bread in person sometime during 2021, my friend. Absolutely. Same here. Guys, this will conclude us for another episode of Nomberg Law Live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Pacific. We've got folks lined up all through the next several weeks through the end of the year. So I hope you keep coming back, whether it's live or catch us on, on the replay. We put this on our YouTube channel and all of our social media. So again, have a safe week. Please continue to be, be patient. We, we're now in, hopefully, our, our world is in a time of healing and moving forward. And happy holiday season coming up. So y'all be well. Take care. <laughs>